Merry Christmas. This is Father Jonathan Meyer. It's hard to believe that just about 11 months ago, over 1,500 men gathered for the E6 Catholic Men's Conference on February 22nd. Here we are, entering into 2021, and we want to let you know that there is hope on the horizon. We will be having an E6 Catholic Men's Conference in 2021. It'll look different. It'll have a lot of the great same content and great ways to form men to armor up. I want to share the homily from last year's conference, and please stay tuned as we share more content from our previous conferences as we get ready for this unique conference in 2021. Tickets will go on sale for our February 27th conference on January the 4th, Monday, also the day that we begin Exodus 90. So please stay tuned and enjoy this homily from last year's conference and get ready for the conference in 2021. God bless you and men, armor up. If you could all see what I see right now, it's either really awesome or really ugly. <laughs> My name is Father Mime, I'm the pastor here at All Saints Parish, and I welcome every single one of you. This conference is truly a miracle, and it's such a blessing uh, to live here in St. Leon, Indiana, and uh, have all of you come from all over the place to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Some of you know that I'm able to welcome you not just as the pastor of All Saints Parish, which I am, so welcome to our parish, but I also uh, welcome you to East Central High School. We're tremendously blessed in our local area with this phenomenal facility, but also with a, with a great school. I'm actually a paid employee of East Central High School. I am one of the cross-country and track coaches, so... Currently, right now, with the track season, we're doing two-a-days, so I'm here every morning and every single afternoon. So I can truly say, welcome to you. Yesterday morning at morning practice at 7 o'clock in the morning, for those of you who are locals, I was talking to Tim Belmer, who has been coaching football here at East Central High School for really since its existence. I said, Tim, tell me, how do you win a football game? Oh, well, Father, you got a lot of things. And he just started, like, couldn't get him to stop talking. <laughs> I said, Tim, what wins football games? Offense or defense? Well, I'll tell you, you need both. You can't. You... Tim, which one wins football games? He says, you can win a whole entire football game if you just have a good defense. He said, Tim, at some point you have to score, right? He says, yeah, but you could win a whole entire game just off of, Tim, I'm pretty sure that you don't win football games unless you have an offense. My brothers, you're going to be told countless times today things that you should be doing. You need to go home and love your wife. You need to go home and love your children. You need to go to confession. You need to pray your rosary. You need to be a man of prayer. I want today to challenge you to be a man who has an offense. For way too long, we as Catholics have been, have been playing defense. In the church world, we refer to this as a church that's in maintenance mode. For those of you who don't know the history of Catholic education in the United States of America, we founded Catholic schools because the Bible was being taught in our public schools. So we founded Catholic schools so that our Catholic students would not be taught heresy. At the Council of Baltimore, the bishops of the United States of America decreed that every parish in the next five years had to open a Catholic school. In this diocese, if you were a Roman Catholic and you did not send your son or your daughter to a Catholic school, 
the pastor had the right to deny you Holy Communion. We built an institution, Catholic education. We can look at our universities. We can look at our hospitals. We can look at all the things that the Catholic Church has built. But once you build something, what do you then have to do? Maintain it, right? How many of you every single weekend have a list from your wife? This is broke. This squeaks. This needs to be painted. Maybe we should just get a new house. It's easy to build, brothers. It's very hard to maintain. And we as a church have been so busy maintaining that we've stopped building. And when I talk about building, I'm talking about going out and winning souls and bringing people to Christ. Our missionary zeal has been compromised, and that needs to change. And every single one of you brothers needs to leave this conference with an offense to go out into this world and win souls for Jesus Christ. We celebrate today the feast of the chair of St. Peter. We are, my brothers, we have the fullness of the truth. We have the fullness of the faith. For those of you who are with us today that are Protestant, for those of you who were brought here by someone or you just came because you were curious, we love you. But the reality is, is that Jesus Christ founded one church. And we, my dear Catholic brothers, we have to be on the offense. So I'd like to spend some time just kind of looking at ways that we can be on the offense. Altar boys, come on out. You're going to see before you right here, Eight questions that I would imagine every single one of you has been asked multiple times in your life. And I would say that that's a problem. It's a really, really bad problem. First question. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Raise your hand if someone has asked you that question. Next question. Why do you worship Mary? Raise your hand if you've ever been asked that question. Next question. Why do you have a pope? Next, why do you worship statues and images, even ones that fall down? Next, <laughs> the Protestants that were here like, were like, look, their statues are falling down. What are we going to do now? Next, why do you call your priest father? What's my name? Father. What's my name? Father. That's right. Next, <laughs> why do you confess your sins to a priest? Hey, guys, why do you confess your sins to a priest? You should just confess your sins to Jesus. You don't need to confess your sins to a priest. Next, why do you baptize infants? Shouldn't we wait until they're like 12 or 13, they can make their own decision? Next, why do you believe you're saved by works? Every single one of you, if, and by the way, if you're a young person, you haven't been asked these questions, well, you will. I don't believe I was asked any of these questions until I went to college, by the way. And that's when I left the faith and became a non-denominational Christian. For those of you who don't know my story. I left the church, became a non-denominational Christian and then came back to the church, thanks be to God. These questions, my brothers, I want to ask a question. Why aren't you asking questions? Because the reality is that we have better questions to ask. But we're not asking them. We don't ask the question. So this is what typically happens. Someone will say, why do you worship Mary? You know, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Yada, 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 yada. They have a verse member. They got the question, they got the verse, and then we're like, uh, um, um, I, I don't know. Um, maybe we do worship statues. Then you're done. Then what are you playing? You're, 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 who's on the offense? They are. Who's playing defense? My brothers, I want you to leave this conference and I want you to be fired up to ask the next eight questions, because these are really powerful questions. I want you to start asking every Protestant you know, so why do you not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood? I mean, you want me to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I mean, I do that every Mass. Like, so why don't you? Because it's very clear in sacred scripture that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. So why don't you want life within you? Like, you're a Christian, right? So you believe you should have life within you, but you're a Christian, right? It's like, you read your Bible, right? You even memorize verses, right? It's like, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, like, 
How do you read that? It's pretty clear what Jesus is saying, right? If you're on the offense, it's a game changer. Great question. Why don't you honor Jesus' mother? I mean, Jesus clearly honored his mother. You say you want to be like Jesus, right? So if Jesus honored his mother, why don't you honor Jesus' mother? Why wouldn't we do what Jesus did? Not to mention the fact that, like, if you ever want to be friends with somebody, like, getting along with their mom is a pretty big deal. (laughs) I'm particularly speaking to anybody who's married here and your (laughs) mother-in-law. Can you truly know your wife and not get along with her mother? I mean, could you imagine the way that many Protestants treat the Blessed Mother if you did that to your mother-in-law. You brought her out at Christmas. Then you wrapped her up in tissue paper and put her in a box. Put her in the basement, or the basement where it's mildewy or in the attic where it's really hot. And didn't bring her out again until next Christmas. Now some of you are like, that sounds like a good idea. Why are we not asking people? I gotta go. Okay. <laughs> Listen. Great question. Why do you think everybody should make up their own truth? Because the reality is, is that like, that's what we're doing. It, when there is no unifying force, which is the chair we celebrate today, the chair of St. Peter. By the way, I would just like to we want to go home and do something. Get rid of the chair in front of the TV and reintroduce the chair at the dining room table. Men should be spending more time at a chair or dining room table with their children gathered around them and less time in front of a television or a computer. If you want to change your life, (laughs) chairs always have been and always will be signs of teaching and authority. What authority are you showing to your children or your grandchildren? And what does that say? Fathers are supposed to gather their family around a meal and a table. Why do we think that it's really great that, like, there's Christians who are pro-choice? There's Christians who think that gay marriage is totally awesome. There's Christians that think that everything is awesome. And you can love Jesus. It's intolerable. What is the great gift of having a pope? Universal truth. Universal truth. This is one of my favorite ones, by the way. Why do you worship statues and images? So this is what you need to do. When you go to your friend's house who's not Catholic and you walk into their house, I just want you to like open the door and then you, you walk in and I just want you to be like, oh my gosh. I didn't know that you practice idol worship. And then be like, what do you pray to this woman for? And like, is that your grandma? Is she like a, a god? Am I supposed to, like, touch this or something? Because there is no difference between people having pictures in their homes or on their iPhones and us having pictures and images of the people that are actually more important than the people who are actually sitting to your left and to your right. The reality is, is the Blessed Virgin Mary is a heck of a lot more important in my life than any of you. And, like, I love you, brothers. But the reality is the saints are more alive and can do more good in your life than any human being because they see God face to face. We don't worship statues. We don't worship images. When I was in high school, I had a picture of Michael Jordan. Big old rollout poster. I didn't worship Michael Jordan. He inspired me. He inspired me to excellence and greatness. He encouraged me. That's what the saints do. And that's why they have the pictures of their grandma on their wall as well. Why do you call your priest father? This is another great one. Like on Father's Day, like call up one of your priests be like, you're not celebrating this day, are you? Because you know what the Bible says. Like you call no one on earth your father. So like you are not, please tell me you're not celebrating this day. I mean, it's crazy to think that like we call our dad father. And I question, I think you should ask your priest or friends is, why don't you call your pastor father? 
I mean, it's very clear. We can go through all the biblical passages, like 1 Corinthians 4.15 or Philippians 2, chapter 22. Like, it's very, very clear, like, from the Bible passages that, like, St. Paul and others, like, refer to themselves as a father. My question is, like, why wouldn't we say that a Protestant pastor is a father? Wouldn't you want your pastor to be a spiritual father to you? I would hope that your pastor is a spiritual father. Otherwise, like, why are you going to that church? Because, like, if he's not fathering you, what's he doing? All these guys up here, uh, over here on your, on, your, on your right over there, they're all sinners. Everybody look at them. <laughs> hey, so, question is this. So we believe that there is a head and a body. You cannot separate a head from a body. So the question is this. Like, if you're going to confess your sins to Jesus, the question is, when did you confess your sins to his body? Throughout the history of the church for 2,000 years, and this is the crazy thing about, about like going to confession, like it's been going on for 2,000 years. You have to confess your sins to Christ in the flesh, which is reconciliation to the head and the body. I know a lot of you are struggling right now because many people are struggling with what's happening in the church. There's a lot of frustration towards priests and bishops. And I would just like to quick throw this in there as well. How many apostles were there? How many of them denied our Lord? How many of them betrayed our Lord? And how many of them abandoned our Lord? Nine. If you do the math, 11 newly ordained priests all denied our Lord, betrayed our Lord, Only one remained faithful. His name was John, and he stood at the foot of the cross. And he would have had to have heard every single one of their confession. Why do we think the church would be different today? Why do you put your faith and your hope in bishops and in priests? They are instruments. They are not saviors. You'll be let down again and again and again. Why do you baptize infants? My question is this. Why do you not give eternal salvation to your children? It's very clear that Christianity comes from Judaism. What happens on the eighth day of every Jewish boy's life? He gets circumcised. You know why they do it on the eighth day, right? So, I mean, like, this is follow, like, the, the logic of our brothers and sisters who are like, well, we want to wait until our child is, like, 12 or 13 years old to make their own decision. Let me just ask you a question, gentlemen. When God the Father was like, hey, Abraham, circumcise uh, all of your kinsmen and your family, and on the eighth day, circumcise all your children, what if God the Father is like, wait until your children are 12 or 13 years old, then ask them whether you want to cut off part of their penis? Like, <laughs> how many Jews would there have been? <laughs> Parents give what is best to their children because they love them, not because they want it, not because they ask for it. And we believe that if we give what is best to our kids and if we show them what is best, they'll actually accept it. You can force your children to eat vegetables and at the age of 18 they can eat nothing but candy. You can force your children to learn English and at some age they might choose to live to a foreign country and learn Chinese. I don't know. You can force your children to go to school and they can throw it all away. And a lot of you have wasted a lot of money that way in your life. The reality is, is that we are called to give what is best to our children. Why do you believe that you're saved by your works? My question is, like, why do you not believe that we should act on our faith? Like, it's so crazy to me when you really think about the fact that, like, that people think that, like, for those of you who have been going to Daily Mass right now, St. James readings are just so good. It's like rock-solid good stuff. For those of you who don't read the Daily Mass readings, you really should. It's such good stuff. But, like, how can we not believe that our faith should be put into actions? I mean, imagine how that would work in your relation with your wife. I love you, honey. Click, click, click. I love you, honey. Like, faith and love have to be put into action. So my brothers, you see those, these pictures, these, these, these signs up here? Take, your, take out your phone, take a picture of them. I want you to go to work on Monday, and I want you to ask these questions to your coworkers. I want you to ask these questions to your brother-in-law. I want you to ask these questions to your neighbor. I want you to knock on the door of everyone in your neighborhood and ask these questions. They do it to us. Why are we doing it to them? And this is what's amazing. 
if you look at what we believe, my dear brothers, is this. We believe that an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ is real and substantial, and you can actually consume it. We believe that honoring women is good. We believe that there is actually truth that is universal and it needs to be protected. We celebrate the family. We believe that fatherhood is really important. We acknowledge our sins, own up to them, and want to change our lives. We give the best to our children, and we act on our beliefs. My question is this, brothers. Who on earth wouldn't want to be a part of this? Who on earth wouldn't want to live for this? And who wouldn't want to die for this? But the reality is, is we're not out there promoting it. I can't do it. You can. I can't go into your workplaces. You can. Some of you might have read a book that came out this past year called Infiltration. I want to ask the question, when are you going to start? When are you going to start infiltrating this world with the truth of Jesus Christ and the church that he founded upon the faith and the confession of Peter? When are you going to start infiltrating our world with the grace and mercy of a love of a God who died for us and loves us and gives us his body and blood every single mass? When? Today. It starts today. That's why we're here. That's why we came. And that's what we're going to go out and do. You don't win games by constantly playing a defense. You have to have an offense. Today, may we receive the flesh and blood of Christ. May we go from here and set the world on fire. Amen?